Hello, St. Giles. It is good to be with you. Welcome to our Good Friday service. This is my wife, Melody, as many of you know her, and this is our housemate, uh, Deirdre, and they're going to help out today as we have a bunch of greetings. Uh, today's service is a mix of greetings and a short reflection, and I hope it is a blessing for you. And then I'll have attached some links to some music below that you can also listen to to accompany um, the service. Uh, I hope you're doing well, and I hope that this is a blessing to you. We're going to start with a call to worship, and then we'll move into some readings, and then, of course, the message um, at the end, and then another reading, and then a benediction. So we'll begin with our call to worship. Blessed be the name of the Lord our God, who redeems, redeems us from sin and death. For us and for our salvation, Christ became obedient unto death even death on a cross. Blessed be the name of the Lord, now and forever. Amen. This is the reading from John chapter 18, verses 1 to 5. After Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, Whom are you looking for? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you far from helping me from the words of my groaning? O oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our ancestors trusted. They trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried and were saved. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not human, scorned by others and despised by the people. All who see me mock at me. They make mouths at me. They shake their heads. Commit your cause to the Lord. Let him deliver. Let him rescue the one in whom he lies. Yet it was you who took me from the womb. You kept me safe on my mother's breast. On you I was cast from my birth, and since my mother bore me, you have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near and there is no one to help. Many bulls encircle me, strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me, like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, it is melted within my breast. My mouth up is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. For dogs are all around me. A company of evildoers encircles me. My hands and feet have shriveled. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O oh Lord, do not be far away. O oh, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. From the horns of the wild oxen you have rescued me. I will tell of your name to my brothers and sisters. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him. Stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he did not despise or abhor the affliction of the afflicted. He did not hide his face from me, but heard when I cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will pay before those who fear him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. 
all the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. To him indeed shall all who sleep in the earth bow down. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, and I shall live for him. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord and proclaim his deliverance to a people yet unborn, saying that he has done it. John chapter 18, verses 33 to chapter 19, verse 3. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate answered him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, What is truth? After he had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him, but you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They shouted in reply, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a bandit. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him on the face. I will now do a responsive reading of Isaiah 52, verse 13 to 53, verse 12. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up and shall be very high. Just as there were many who were astonished at him, so marred was his appearance beyond human semblance, and his form beyond that of mortals. So he shall startle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which had not been told them, they shall see. And that which they had not heard, they shall contemplate. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. And as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All, All we like sheep have gone, gone astray. We have turned to our own way, and the, the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that is silent before its shears, so he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice, he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgressions of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Out of his anguish he shall see light. The righteous one shall make many righteous and shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors.
John chapter 19, verses 16 to 19, and then 28 to 34. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross that read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, it is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a day of great sol solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. Thank you to our readers. Um, hopefully you felt like you could kind of follow um, the both the gospel story, the crucifixion, and also some of the Old Testament references. Um, there, the scriptures will also be in the notes below um, if you need to look back uh, as you follow along. So you guys can go, and I'm going to do a short reflection. I won't make them sit there the whole time I preach. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Have you ever put your hope in something just to find yourself extremely disappointed? Maybe you were invited into an investment opportunity where you were promised a big return, but in the end, it ended up being a scam. Perhaps you had hoped that the next diet would be the right one that would totally help you lose weight and get back on track. But in the end, it still couldn't fix the habits that are so deeply ingrained within you. It couldn't address the pain that you feel that makes you eat. And in the end, you didn't lose any weight. Or you really believed that a particular politician was really going to bring the change that you long for. I remember when President Obama was first running and the hope that was in so many of my friends. I remember them really thinking that he was gonna bring huge social change to America and help end poverty. I don't use that example to discredit the president for what he did, but people I think now had unreal expectations and hopes for what he could actually achieve. Have you ever hoped that a political leader would somehow rescue the economy? or the impoverished? Did you hope that somehow they could change the entire system that you thought wasn't working? Or have you put your hope in a romantic relationship? You know, hoping that this individual was the one and in the end found yourself actually extremely disappointed. I have. Way back in my undergrad days, I got engaged very young. I was only in second year university. And I was so naive. I thought I was ready. And, you know, why just date someone forever if um, you think you're going to get married? And, you know, any two people should be able to make something work. The woman was terrific. And so I just thought it should work. But unfortunately, it turns out I was incredibly unaware. And I was a people pleaser our relationship came to a painful end as we realized that our uh, lives were going in completely different directions. I remember this woman looking at me and saying, I do not want to be a pastor's wife. And I looked at her and said, well, that's fine. 
I don't want to be a pastor. Apparently, I had very little awareness about what God was actually doing in my life. But luckily, she did. I was very young and foolish. When life does not turn out as planned, it is easy for us to lose hope. Hope that we'll ever be successful, secure, happy, or that we'll ever experience a life full of purpose and meaning. And in those moments, we realize how fragile the things that we have put our hope in actually are our finances, our health, our relationships, our jobs. All of these things are great and good in and of themselves, but they're temporal. They can help please us in the short term, but they're likely to leave us feeling disappointed and longing for more in the long term. Today, the church takes time to honor Good Friday the day that we retell the story of Jesus' crucifixion and his death, a story that on its own would not bring honor to God. And yet it's one of the most important stories of our faith. It's a story where people's hopes were dashed and their expectations thwarted. For those who were following Jesus at the time, on this particular day, the day that Jesus died, Their hope was shattered in a way that would have broken their hearts. Their religion and their societal narrative believed that this rescuer would come. And they believed that though they were a people that were oppressed and not free, that someone would come to bring them the freedom that they longed for. They believed that the world would be set back to the way it was supposed to be that they would see themselves benefit economically, socially, and culturally from this promised person who would be from the line of the King David of the Israelites. They would finally have a king who would bring them this freedom that they longed for. I imagine they pictured someone like Moses, someone who would stand up to Pharaoh At the time, the Pharaoh person, the equivalent would have been Caesar, the leader of Rome. And they needed someone who would demand that the Romans set the Hebrew people free. And if Rome refused, I imagine that they expected that God, once again, like he did so many years ago, would do numerous miracles to show the world that the God of Israel was the greatest of all gods. And I, it's hard to know for sure, but I imagine that the people believed that God would use force if needed, that lives would be lost, that blood would be shed. This is how victory was gained in their understanding. But now they stand there watching their leader be killed. And he isn't even trying to defend himself or fight back. He's spat on, taunted, and ridiculed, and he seems to not even care if the things that he is being charged with are correct. What kind of rescuer is this? Jesus' followers must be asking themselves, were we wrong? For a while, Jesus had talked to his disciples about how he would need to suffer and die. And he said that it was through death that one truly experiences life. The disciples had a hard time grasping this, though. What did Jesus actually mean? Then, before the death, we have this scene in the upper room where Jesus took the cup at the Passover meal and the bread, and he talked about blood being shed and his body being broken. Again, weird. Remember him saying, do this in remembrance of me. What was he talking about? What kind of plan does Jesus have? If I was in that room that day, I bet I would have thought the wine is the blood and the body is the bread. It's just a metaphor. That's all it is, right? The disciples watched as Jesus was betrayed by one of their own and judged and tried by Pilate, the crowd. Some of the same people that had gathered a week before 
to take in his teaching and his miracles and had yelled Hosanna and declared him to be king are now turning on him and yelling, crucify him. The disciples fearing for their own lives flee from the scene. They're scattered. None of them are willing to stand with Jesus at this time of trial. None are willing to stand up against the empire and the state and the power that is present in their, in, in that time. To, to say that they believed that this was the one that was going to save Israel. Now the thought that Jesus was their promised Messiah had must have felt in this moment extremely foolish. They were overcome with fear, shame, unbelief, and a desire to protect themselves. Three years of following this teacher and all of their hopes feel like they're crashing down. The same man who the disciples had hailed as king only a few days before, they watch him die. How could this event ever begin the type of revolution that they long for, the type of revolution that they needed so that they could be free? How could the death of the promised rescuer ever set people free? The disciples feel their world crashing in around them. In many ways, it feels like all is lost. Where is this kingdom that Jesus talked so much about? What good could come out of Jesus being crucified and dying? How do the disciples respond? Why well, they respond like I imagine many of us would. They return back to what is comfortable, back to what they know. They go back to their old jobs. They go back to fishing, family business. They go back to what they've known. This whole experience of the past three years does not make sense in their current paradigm. How do you be a Jesus follower? Jesus is dead. Rome still has the power, sickness still prevails, death still rules the day. What hope do they actually have? Are you feeling a lack of hope these days? This coronavirus thing has been hard on everyone. We're locked up, we're waiting. There's so much waiting right now. Are there hopes that you had that have just fallen away? People are seeing their venues postponed for their weddings. And many people now live in this uncertainty about whether or not they can get married and when they can actually get married. And all these dreams about their big day are put on hold and lost. So many people have lost jobs, almost more every day so sad. Vacations canceled. I have friends that were supposed to be going to Paris. They're not going now. Graduations and class trips gone. And there's many, many, many older adults who are suffering in isolation and in silence. I really think that a situation like this one in the world causes us to realize that we put our hope and trust in things that are often temporary and can be fleeting. If we honestly believed that we needed the perfect wedding or the ideal experience for someone's birthday or that this particular trip was going to give us happiness, those things are all out the window. We're in a time where things are not gonna go as planned. If people, relationships, careers, fame, esteem, politicians and wealth are not where we're gonna put our hope, then what do we cling to? At the end of the day, what has the power to set you free? To allow us to love wholly and be and, and freely, to be able to love all generously, to help 
people be who they were always meant to be, not carrying the weight of fear, shame, and insecurity. Maybe you even feel like you've put your hope and trust in God and that he didn't show up. He wasn't faithful. He isn't who you thought he was. You've been hurt, confused. You've experienced your heart hardened or you've moved to unbelief. Maybe you're like the many people that have been deeply hurt by the church. And then you assume that then the church must be like God himself. Why put your hope in a God that you cannot trust? Just this week, I had an experience once again where I realized how temporal the things that we can put our hope in. Um, I've been feeling really fit and really active um, as it's now a year since my last surgery on my cancer journey. And I am hoping to do um, another half marathon and hopefully a full marathon soon. And just this week, I had another CT scan. And all of those feelings of knowing that maybe my health will once again be taken away from me, either permanently or just for a season, caused such a rush of emotion. And you realize how many things you're putting your hope in that are temporal, that will not truly ever bring us happiness, no matter how much we love them and how great they truly are. I need to put my hope in something greater. The disciples had thought that maybe Jesus could be that person that they could rely on, that they could put their hope in, that perhaps his power over sickness, evil, nature, and death itself could possibly be positioning him as the person who could finally bring the Jewish people freedom. They didn't understand that for true life to come first comes death for restoration to come in our relationship with God. Because of our own rebellion, because we have said we want to do life on our own and we would rather not have him call the shots. We would rather not have him be our dad. Because of that, first, there needs to be sacrifice before restoration can take place. Someone or something must die. They didn't realize that they did not understand who their rescuer fully was. And they also didn't understand the extent that they themselves actually needed rescue. The disciples did not just need political, social, and economic revolution, but they actually needed their entire hearts to be transformed and resurrected back to life. As they stared at Jesus taking his last breath on the cross and being placed in the tomb, their own ideas surrounding the king that they were waiting for also died. As their hope is placed in the grave, perhaps I wonder if something new starts to happen. Whether now there's finally space for new ideas, new understanding, and new life to come. But right now on Friday, all the disciples know is grief, pain, and loss. Their lives have been shaken. Their friend and their teacher is gone and their future is completely unknown. They probably had tons of ideas about what their life would be like following Jesus. And right now, as they watch him being placed in the tomb, all of that feels like it's gone. Everything that they've been working towards for the last three years. As the darkness covers the earth, their souls and their hearts, I believe, are also clouded. Is God still good? Is he actually faithful? How could he have allowed these events to happen? Questions flood their hearts and their minds. And an eerie stillness covers the earth and covers their hearts. What will happen next? 
How will God respond? Will hope be restored? Is this the end of the story? Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever felt like the thing that you were putting your hope in was laid in the grave and you had to watch it die? Have you ever looked and, and thought, I have no idea now what my life is going to look like. Everything changes because of this moment. Have you ever asked the bigger questions? Is God actually real? Does my life matter? What is this whole life about? What have you done with those questions? What do the things that you've put your hope in show you about how you're answering those questions? For us now, on this side of the story, we know that next comes Sunday. We know that hope is coming for the disciples. But is there a part of your heart that still resonates with where the disciples are at on Friday? The grief, the pain, the suffering, the loss. Can you talk to God about the places where you've put your hope in something and it has not turned out as planned and you've experienced a lot of pain? If you're willing to do that, what do you think God wants to say back to you? Do you think he understands? Do you think he cares? Do you think he sees your grief? Do you think he sees your loss? Is he present? Will you be bold enough to ask him and see if he may reveal himself to you in the midst of the grief today as we stand with the disciples and we acknowledge the pain the hurt and the disappointment that exists in our world as we lay to the rest some things that we really thought would bring us life. Let's pray. We come to the foot of your cross and we bow with the disciples. We ponder the mystery of your life and death with Mary and proclaim the truth of who you are with those who witnessed your love and action. We come to you this day because you first came to us. We come loving you because you first loved us. We come to serve you because you first served us. We come to worship you as the creator, Christ, and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and always. You are a God of loving kindness. You sent Christ into the world that we might have life and have it abundantly. Yet we live lives that are often deadly, certainly less than you would have them be. We allow your world to be filled with violence and terror. Our trust in you is shallow and our faithfulness falters. In the face of uncertainty and trouble, we forget your loving kindness governs all things. Forgive who we have been, amend who we are, and through and direct who we are, who we shall be through Christ our Savior and Lord. God, we bring to you all of our pain, all of our uncertainty, all of our fear, all of our grief today. God, there are so many with heavy hearts, especially right now as our whole world works through this COVID-19 issue. God, there are so many who are asking where they may put their hope. God, I pray that you would meet us in the question. Are you faithful? Are you good? Do you see us? Do we matter? Meet us in the pain and the questions. Will you provide for us? Can you make a way out? Will we be okay? Would you come and speak to us and help us to know that you are good? We pray all of these things in the loving name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.
We're about to conclude. Melody is just going to come and do one more gospel reading for us to help finish up our story. And then we'll do a benediction. This is John chapter 19, verses 36 to 42. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices in linen cloths, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Thank you. It has been really good to be with you today. I hope you are blessed on this Good Friday. I want to remind you, we'll also have uh, our Easter Sunday service up um, on Sunday on our YouTube channel and on our website. And for those within the St. Giles community, hopefully emailed you to you as well. And uh, we wish you a very good weekend as you reflect on the death and the resurrection of our King. As we go, may we go in peace, and I'll just simply read this benediction for you. O Christ, the master carpenter, who at last, through wood and nails, purchased our whole salvation, wield well your tools in the workshop of your world, so that we who come rough-hewn to your bench may here be fashioned to a truer beauty in your hand. We ask it for your own name's sake. Amen. May you go in peace. Blessings to you. Goodbye.